Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be here today, and I, I'm so thankful for Chuck and him stepping up and uh, leading us for all these months uh, in uh, our praise to God in the first service, and I just want to share that uh, the search team, uh, the wor- worship pastor, uh, creative art, sorry, also pastor uh, search team met uh, this past week, and I just would ask you to be praying for them as they begin uh, their uh, process of searching for the man who would lead us uh, as one of our pastors, and then, of course, uh, through uh, the time of singing uh, in both services, um, what an important uh, role uh, as we move forward as a church. And so just please be praying uh, for that team. Uh, the chairman of that team is Roger Smith, who has stepped up in our second service, and um, I know you'll be praying for them. And then I just want to praise God. Um, in your bulletin, you've probably already noticed uh, our total uh, giving uh, for the year of 2017. And if you uh, did not see that, our undesignated gifts, and this is without some uh, year-end gifts that'll be trickling in over the next uh, few days that are postmarked by the end of the year, was almost $2.1 million. Um, That's undesignated uh, tithes and offerings. And so uh, I would like to take credit for that. Uh, But I've only been here a month, so (laughs) I can't. But praise God for um, his faithfulness to us and for your generosity and how that is uh, being used uh, for the kingdom. And the reality is, is as we continue to pray about what is in the future for our church, uh, one of the essential uh, aspects of that is a generous people, of people who believe uh, and obey God and give uh, with a cheerful uh, heart out of uh, abundance to uh, the mission of God. And so I praise God for where we are and pray that that will continue. And I I pray if you're not a part of that, uh, you're not a participant in what God is doing, that you will begin to discern uh, through his help, through the help of the Spirit, how you can be involved uh, in our church and what God is doing, not just through giving, while that is certainly one aspect, through serving in some way, through growing and being a part of one of our Sunday school classes, and ultimately through sharing your story with those who might be your neighbors, your coworkers, the people you see at the grocery store, wherever it may be, who do not know about the Jesus that you know. And that is really how uh, we begin to see God uh, multiply an effort of uh, those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And speaking of multiply, I would like to invite everyone uh, tonight uh, to the beginning of our Sunday night Bible studies. Uh, I'm going to be going. Um, it's loosely based on a book, Multiply, but I'm going to be r- pulling from a few different other books and, of course, one important book, and that's the Bible. Uh, and we're going to be talking about discipleship. And in your bulletin, there's an insert there, and it kind of gives you the material that we're going to cover. Now, if you're looking at the dates and you're thinking, oh, okay, I can start in March, you're going to be behind. You're going to be a little lost when you come in March. And we've been talking about discipleship and journeying together as a group. And so I know that uh, it's a busy season for a lot of people as we get the year started off. But um, if you, uh, if that's something that interests you, or if you're not a part of any other kind of Bible study, then I would love for you to join us here at 515. The reason we move that time to 515 is we have Awanas for our children at five o'clock on Sundays. And so if you have children of that age, you can drop them off at five o'clock uh, Uh, Run as fast as you can away from them and then join us uh, in the worship center at 515 and we'll be done in time for you to be able to pick them up or else uh, the volunteers will be coming and knocking on the door uh, to bring my kids back to me. Um, Anyway, well, some of you here today are are here and you're at church and maybe it's the first time you've been uh, here in a while. Uh, Maybe you're at, this is your first time here with us because you're seeking out maybe the church that God have, would have you to be a part of. And you know that you are called to be a part of God's plan. You're called to be a part of what God is doing in this world, but you don't really know where to start. And today we're beginning in the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter one. And as we begin in the book of Acts, this is going to be something that's very relevant to those of you who may have lived your life even as a Christian, not seeing a lot of fruit, not seeing your life being one that was poured into the lives of others. Maybe you're here today and you've known Jesus for a long time and yet you have failed to share the gospel with someone or to lead someone else to Christ. And so this is an important 
place for you to be, an important place for us to start, as those here may be sensing that calling and that direction in their lives. And then today is also important for us as a church as we really begin to move forward this year with how God would you want to work in the life of our church so that what you've done over the course of, of decades here might be multiplied in this community and beyond. And today as, today as we start in Acts chapter 1, we're going to talk about what is needed for a gospel movement, what is needed for a gospel movement. So if you will, read with me Acts chapter 1. Verse 1 through 8, it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray together. God, every Sunday, I need your help, just as I need your help every single day. And God, as we're talking about the power of your spirit, God, I pray that your spirit would help me to articulate things that are so important, that are life-changing, that give purpose, that give meaning, that align our lives with your will for our lives. And God, there's no way that a man could fully convey the seriousness of our need to obey you. There's no way that a man could convince hearts who may be set upon living their lives the way that they want to melt before you. But God, I believe that your spirit is this powerful. I believe that you are this powerful. I believe that your word is this powerful. And what I pray today, God, is I would decrease and that you would increase and that you would work starting with me in all of our hearts and all of our minds so that we might further our love for you and our obedience to your mission. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Before I make the points that I plan to make today, I want to make sure that we understand what we are reading here. So this is written to a guy named Theophilus, who most scholars would say is the financier of Luke's writings. Luke wrote a gospel that's named Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts. And in Luke, Paul, uh, Luke refers to um, Theophilus as most excellent, which would be a term that you would use, you would give to somebody who's of high social status, like a governor or political uh, official. And so in, in Luke, what Luke writes about is the ministry and the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And then Acts would be the second installment of Luke's account, and it gives us, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. And the beginning of Acts overlaps where Luke finishes up, where Luke finishes off, where I will read from later on as we're going through our text today, where Jesus is with the disciples before he ascends to heaven. And this is where we will see things that we need for a gospel movement. In verse 3, we see two things. Let me read verse 3 again. It says, He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, the first thing that's needed for a gospel movement can be easily overlooked in reading this passage, but it is foundational to what happens in Acts. What we're about to, my point I'm about to make is foundational to what happens in Acts and what happens in any church. The first thing you need for a gospel movement is people who know that Jesus is alive. The first thing that you know, need for a gospel movement is people who know that Jesus is alive. Now, research was done not too long ago from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and what it found was 63% of Christians people that would label themselves Christians, are not convinced, without a shadow of doubt, that Jesus rose from the grave. Now, there's a guy, 
He's a scholar, Dr. Gary Habermas from Liberty University, Go Flames. And uh, he did probably the most comprehensive investigation of the resurrection. He took 1,400 scholarly works. And, from the, and those were liberal works to conservative works. And almost all of those works concluded the following things to be true. That, in, that Jesus did in die, indeed die by Roman crucifixion. There is very little debate as to whether or not Jesus died by Roman crucifixion from almost all scholars. That Jesus was buried, probably in a private tomb. That the disciples then were discouraged. So the disciples were following Jesus, but most scholars would admit, would say upon their work, that there was this period in which the disciples were then discouraged. They would next say the tomb was found empty very soon afterwards. They would also say that the disciples believed that they saw Jesus. They would say then that something happened to where the disciples' lives were transformed from discouraged people to people willing to die for their belief that Jesus was alive. Almost all scholars would say that the resurrection of Jesus was proclaimed from the beginning of the life of the New Testament church. People would say that Jerusalem is where this was proclaimed, where Jesus was crucified and buried. And also, history would show that the church began to gather on Sunday from its beginning because that is when they believed that Jesus rose from the grave. And all these things appear to be historically accurate. But they don't prove to us that Jesus rose from the grave. But they do lead us to the great possibility that Jesus rose from the grave, or there has to be some other explanation. And so what I want to do quickly is I want to uh, look at the five most popular theories that say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. One would be the hallucination theory. The hallucination theory is that the disciples were delusional, that they were fanatics, and so they made this up in their mind. You know, we, we see all kinds of crazy things get made up in the name of religion, that people would have visions of certain things. We certainly know that to be true. And so one of the theories is that the disciples, in the same way that other religions might be misled because of their fanaticism, that they too would, would make this up. But here are some things about that. One is they were dying for this. Remember that. This is a fate the fate of the disciples, excuse me, was a fate that was not favorable to their life on earth. And so the religion did not become something to use for their earthly gain, but in fact led to their demise. Also remember, if you're thinking about the idea that this might have been a hallucination, records are that Jesus was eating and drinking so that he actually appeared in a physical presence and ate with them and drank with them. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which tells us that Cephas and the 12, Peter and the 12, saw Jesus alive. Another 500 saw Jesus alive. James, J Jesus' half-brother, saw him alive. And Paul, who was an enemy of Jesus Christ, had an encounter with Jesus and became a follower of Jesus. Also, what you see very quickly in the life of the church is doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus. And it spread very quickly. And many were alive who were hearing this. And so the, the, one of the critiques of the Bible is that it was written, you know, 30, 40, 50 years after Jesus died. And so people would say, well, because it was written that long after Jesus died and, and allegedly rose from the grave— you can't necessarily trust it. But you don't understand that there were still many who were alive that had been alive at the time of Jesus when these things are being written. You know, let's take, take the date January 28th, 1986 to let you know how young some of you think I am. I, I was three. And, <laughs> and uh, something big happened on that day, and that was that the Challenger exploded. Now, I was three years old, and so I don't remember the Challenger exploding. And so it's been 30 years now, 30 plus years since that happened. And so for me then to say, or anyone who's alive, maybe born after me to say, well, I can't really believe that it happened because that was 30 years ago. 
You, you understand the logic there. There are many people here today who could say, I saw it with my own two eyes, or I knew people who saw it with their own two eyes. I'll go back even further to January, or November 22nd, 1963. Instantly brings up something for some of you. That's the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. At this point, we're talking 50 plus years. And so many of the people who are part of our church were not alive at this point. And so what we would do in using the same logic that critiques the New Testament being written 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus is to say, well, there's no way we can trust that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And so, and so my point there is just to help you to understand that the, the idea of Jesus rising from the grave and him making a physical pr- appearance was something that was seen by many, many of whom were still alive whenever the, the, the writings of Paul, specifically, were beginning to circulate and the Gospels were beginning to circulate all throughout the known, the known world. Another theory is the wrong tomb theory. And I apologize because I said I would go quickly through this, but that was not true. Uh, the wrong tomb theory. And the, the wrong tomb theory says the disciples went to the wrong tomb And it was empty. And so they just were confused. Now, here is what all generations struggle with doing. Looking at people in history and thinking, man, they're 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 so dumb. You know, like we're so much smarter than every generation that ever lived. Every generation struggles with feeling that way. But that's that's arrogance. That's progressive generational arrogance to think the people who lived 2,000 years ago were primitive men. So to think that they went to the wrong tomb, it was empty, and they're like, well, Jesus must have rose from the grave, is really arrogant. Another thing is the Jewish leaders and the Roman guards knew where the tomb was. So they could prove this wrong. They could say, actually, he's buried right here. Why didn't they do that? And this also doesn't explain the belief that he was alive. Remember, they had denied Jesus. They had pretty much ran away, and now they had the strong belief and passion in the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. Another theory is the swoon theory, which is that Jesus didn't actually die. He was unconscious, and so he came out of the grave when he regained consciousness. The problem with that is that the Romans were professional executioners. History and archaeology would support that statement. And so they knew what they were doing. And to say that they didn't kill him on the cross says that they didn't know what they were doing. Dr. Alexander Metherell would say that the, the things that happened to Jesus would result in a cardiac arrest and that his lungs would have been pierced and likely his heart was pierced. You also have to understand that the Jews wanted Jesus dead. They wanted him dead, and they were going to make sure that he died. And also, here's what you're saying when you say that Jesus was unconscious, put in the grave, and then came out. That a badly beaten Jesus removed the stone from the tomb, outmaneuvered the Roman soldiers, and escaped. If that is true, I would still probably follow him. I mean, you think of Jason Bourne and all these, Jesus has got him beat. They just need to make a trilogy on Jesus' life as who he is. Also, what I would say is that there are historical references to Jesus' death by Josephus, Tacitus, Thallus, and even in the Talmud. Another theory is the substitution theory, and that's that someone else died on the cross. Muslims believe that it wasn't Jesus on the cross. This is in the Quran. This was said, of course, 600 years later uh, by Muhammad. Um, What this alleges, again, is that the Romans and the Jews are really, and the disciples, are really dumb. That they're really dumb. Why then all the eyewitnesses? Why all the historical references that Jesus died? if it wasn't Jesus who died. And also, again, it doesn't answer the question, why was the tomb empty? And it's important to understand that the Jewish leaders did not try to deny the empty tomb, they tried to explain it. That is significant. The historian Justin says that stories of the disciples stealing Jesus' body were still being spread into the middle of the second century. 
And so that brings me to the last and the most popular theory of the five that I'm going to cover is that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. That the disciples outmaneuvered the Roman soldiers, the empire of Rome here, and stole the body of Jesus. Now, in our church, we have two different groups of people that serve in our U.S. military or have. Uh, These are ends of the spectrum, but we have engineers and we have some special forces soldiers. Now, you engineers have many positive attributes about you, but to think of you overtaking our seventh group guys is very unlikely. And so to think about these disciples outmaneuvering these Roman soldiers, and if there was a large amount, you'd say, well, there was a large amount of them. The idea of them not communicating and getting back up here to defend the guarding of this tomb, which was a highly politicized person that was in this tomb, is outrageous to think. Also, resurrection back into the body, and this is important, was not something to be desired by a Jewish person. Jews would not have claimed individual resurrection, leaving others to this world. This isn't something they would have claimed. N.T. Wright says this, no one would have invented the empty tomb and the meetings or sightings of the risen Jesus. Nobody was expecting this kind of thing. No kind of conversion experience would have invented it, no matter how guilty they felt, no matter how many hours they poured over the scriptures. To suggest otherwise is to stop doing history and to enter into a fantasy world of our own. And I'll also once again say, the fate of the disciples is that they stole the body to get beaten, tortured, and martyred. And you compare that with other religions and kings and how their faith led them until they were killed to great prosperity. Now, not one thing I said gives you absolute proof, but all of this evidence shows us that there is a real probability that Jesus rose from the grave. It's dependent upon one factor. William Lane Craig says this, I would argue that the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead is not at all improbable. In fact, based on the evidence, it is the best explanation for what happened. What is improbable is the hypothesis that Jesus naturally rose from the dead. That, I would agree, is outlandish. Any hypothesis would be more probable than saying the corpse of Jesus spontaneously came back to life. But the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead doesn't contradict science or any known facts of experience. All it requires is the hypothesis that God exists. And I think there are good independent reasons for believing that he does. As long as the existence of God is even possible, it's possible that he acted in history by raising Jesus from the dead. Now, the reason that I went through all that, there are two. Number one, Christians, there is faith in believing Jesus rose from the grave, but it is not blind faith. There is a lot of support and a lot of evidence to what you claim to believe today. And do not let the devil discourage you and make you feel dumb for your faith. Because not only do you know within inside because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, But the reality is there is a lot to support your faith claim. The second reason that I say this today is because in this room, I'm sure there's somebody in here who is not a Christian, who has, even if they label themselves a Christian, has not surrendered themselves, bowed down at the feet of our risen king, have not surrendered to him. And you may even, about the resurrection, have the feelings of, I don't know about all that. But inside of you, there is a draw. There is a prompting. There is a leading to believe these things, that you are called to something more than just your life. And there is an undeniable effect and an undeniable impact on the world because of whatever happened 2,000 years ago. And here is what I would say to you. The burden of proof lies with you. 
You may think, well, until somebody proves that Jesus rose from the dead to me, I will not believe. And here's what I would say to you. When you stand before God, having ignored the drawing of the Holy Spirit, will you say, nobody proved it to me? And he, and he will say, he will, probably won't say this, but he could say, well, did you look into it? And why did you not look into it? And Romans 1 tells us why. Because in our unrighteousness, we suppress the truth. And we become satisfied with our worldly desires. And what every Christian does is every Christian knows that Jesus is alive and they surrender to our powerful king. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. With the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth, a person confesses, resulting in salvation. And that is not the translation you have up there, but that's the one I have it memorized in. That's the essentials of a Christian, belief in the resurrection and submission to him. And I would say that as you look at those verses, the intellectual knowledge is not enough, but we understand that Jesus is Lord. We know that he is alive, and so we hear and we obey him. And look at verse three. It says, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The second thing that we need for a gospel movement is people who live for the kingdom of God of God. People who live for the kingdom of God, because we know that Jesus is alive, we want to hear what he has to say. He's the king, and we want to obey him. And what does he teach on? He teaches on the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus taught on. At the beginning of his ministry, and I, I think we overlook this way too much as Christians, but at the beginning of his ministry, Luke, let's use Luke's gospel, 42 and chapter 4, verse 42 and 43. It says, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. Jesus came to this earth to teach on the kingdom of God. So if there is a king, that means that if there's a kingdom, that means there is a king. There is someone who is ruling and reigning. And if we live in a kingdom, it is important for us to know who is ruling and who is reigning. And Jesus was, this is what he was teaching about. In fact, he taught us to pray this way, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's saying, we want God's kingdom, what it's going to be like in eternity. We want to see that here. And so as Christians then, understanding that, what we do is we try to hear what the king has to say. And we try to obey what the king has to say. So whenever Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, look at what the disciples ask him. Verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now, here's how we get distracted. Notice the question they ask. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What they're confused about is they're confused that what Jesus is talking about is an earthly kingdom. They're confused that what Jesus is talking about is an economic kingdom. It's a political kingdom. And this is not what Jesus is teaching about. In church, and I'm... First, to admit that I struggle with this this as well. We get distracted by seeking more than obedience to the will of God, more than hearing and obeying what the king has to say, our economic and our political restoration, maybe, I would say, in these days in our culture. When Jesus says, it's not for you to know. It's not for you to know. But he's teaching them on living for the kingdom of God. He's teaching them on seeing this world be like heaven. And they would struggle with this. But notice something in the life of the church. That after Pentecost, there was no confusion by the apostles. There was no confusion by the disciples as to what the will of God was for their lives. And the third thing that we need for a gospel movement is why 
they weren't confused anymore. And that is people who have received the Holy Spirit. In order for the gospel to spread through us as a church and as individuals, we need to know that Jesus is alive. We need to live for the kingdom of God. Why do we live for the kingdom of God? Because we know that he's alive. And we need to receive the Holy Spirit. What Jesus said to them here in verse 4 and 5, I'll back up. He said, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. The Holy Spirit had been prophesied about in the Old Testament, specifically in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. This is the promise of the Father to believers. And it's the promise of the Father to every believer. When Peter would give his sermon, and we'll get there in a few weeks, he says this at the end of his sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So you're saved, you're righteous. At that moment, you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive from Jesus the Holy Spirit. And listen to what verse eight says here back in our main text in Acts chapter one to the disciples about when they will receive the Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. See, people wrestle with this so much with receiving the power of God and obeying what God has to say. And, 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 and sharing the gospel. Now, I need you to understand this. That the key to us seeing immeasurable, exponential, evangelistic growth in the life of our church isn't me leading everybody to Christ. It's every one of us sharing the gospel. That's how real movements of God happen. Is when every believer understands I'm an ambassador of Christ. I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of God. But as I say that then, a burden is on you potentially to go and share the gospel. And we feel these feelings like, and I don't know if you guys, you're the choir, so you're doing this, right? I'm preaching the choir right now. Um, is especially in a world that's kind of hesitant to God. It's like this tension of, am I gonna be too pushy? Or Am I not going to move fast enough? And here's what I would say to you. You have the Holy Spirit to help you with that. And do we believe the text that says that? That we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we will be his witnesses. Do we believe that? That we would just say, God, I'll, I'll have the willing heart and you help me and guide me in the conversation. You might say, I don't know all the answers to their questions. They might start questioning the reliability of the Bible, and I don't know all that Gary Habernas stuff the pastor was talking about. Or maybe, maybe they'll ask me, did Adam and Eve have a belly button? <laughs> you, have to, you had to be here last week to fully get that one. And you're like, I don't know the answers to that. You have the Holy Spirit. And I practically say two things. Number one is the Holy Spirit will recall things to your memory because the Holy Spirit wants that person to know Jesus Christ as their Savior in a way that is supernatural. And number two is the Holy Spirit will give you the time in that relationship with somebody that they didn't go and research the answer to their questions. You have the Holy Spirit. You might say, I don't know if this person's sincere, if they really want to follow Jesus or not. You have the Holy Spirit. God is with you. And, and he will empower us to be witnesses in Jerusalem and to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And let me tell you something. When Jesus said that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 2,000 years later, it's true. It's true. And so this is why it is okay for us to have a big vision to say, hey, we want to double in size as a church. And we want to help other churches plant. And we want to give more away to, to missionaries overseas than we ever have before. Because this is the will of the Father. 
And the Holy Spirit will empower us to do this. And so why wouldn't we just go down swinging for the kingdom of God in a big way? And let me say this. The evidence of the Spirit is not in us appearing to be spiritual. And I know that there are churches today, and they guilt you if you don't exercise the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a certain way, which is obvious, honestly often against what 1 Corinthians tells us worship should look like. Here's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's not all that. It's people being witnesses. And so if we are witnesses, I mean, if we are children of God, then the Spirit will be empowering us to be witnesses. And the name of Jesus will become the name that is on the lips and the tongue of more and more people because that's what the Holy Spirit exists to do, to glorify Jesus. Not a man to glorify Jesus. And this is what he wants to do through the life of every believer here today. And I don't care if you have spent 40 years of your Christian life doing very little for the kingdom of God and you think I'm in the last season of my life. Let me tell you something. God can work through you right now. Do not believe any other thing other than the fact that the Spirit wants to use you in the season. And here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm super encouraged about. I really am believing God for this. Not only are we in the coming years going to see an influx of young people and hopefully young people getting passionate about God, but I believe we're going to see some of our older generation more and more committed to being witnesses. I believe that. I want that. And so let me close with the last words that Jesus said in Luke chapter 24 that coincide with what he says here in Acts chapter 1. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, which would be the promise of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And from here, we're believers today. From what happened and what we're reading right now, you and I who follow Jesus are followers of Jesus. People who know that Jesus is alive. And what I would say to you today is that if you haven't surrendered your life to him, that the burden of proof lies with you. And maybe you have more questions about that. That's why we're here. We're here to walk you through that and help you with that. Maybe today you know Jesus is alive and I need to give my life to him. Then I pray that as we respond in song in just a moment, that you would come down to the altar, that you would pray to commit your life to Jesus Christ people who know that Jesus is alive, people who live for the kingdom of God. God, help us all to hear and obey you and people who have received the Holy Spirit, which is the promise of the Father who never lies. Christians, we have everything that we need for a gospel movement in and through us. Pray with me. God, thank you for your word and its power. And I pray today that you would help us to respond and obey you and have however you might be leading us to do that. For some of us, it's, it's the realization that we have everything we need. We really have no excuses to not be on mission for you and to be using our gifts for you. And so God, I pray that you would, we would repent and we would surrender maybe in a new way to the ministry that you would have us to live. And God, that we would just take steps of faith in in sharing the gospel and steps of faith and being in people's lives and trust that your spirit will do the work that you promised that it will do. God, I pray that we would stop inviting you to join us in what we're doing and we would start looking to what you're doing and join you in that. God, I pray that we would open your word and we would hear and obey because you're the king. 
and we would understand not to live for economic or political kingdoms, but to live for the kingdom of God. And God, I pray that we would be deeply emboldened by the fact that you're alive every single day. And God, I pray that if there's somebody here today who has been resistant, hesitant, skeptical, ignorant, whatever word you want to use to giving their life to you, God, that they would not leave this place without bowing down before you and surrendering their life to you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.